Good evening, everyone. And since we're a small crowd, you're very welcome to move further to the front if you like. We're, it's going to be a bit more of an uh, intimate discussion because it's quite small given that there's exams. And since there's exams, we really appreciate you coming out to what will undoubtedly be a fascinating talk from our great guest speaker, Eileen Dong. My name is Jen Tridgell, and I'm one of the executive directors of the Cambridge Pro Bono Project, which is an initiative that resides within the, uh, within the Cambridge Faculty of Law and primarily revolves around a number of research projects that we do each year for a number of organisations, civil society, barristers, and so on, for different matters that pertain to the public interest. And this covers areas of environmental law, criminal law, public international law, environmental law, and so on. And my fellow executive directors send their regrets that they were unable to make it tonight. They very much wish to be here. I would like to thank very much Bo Min, our fantastic event coordinator, for putting on this event this evening, and also to Dr. Stephanie Palmer, eminent scholar of human rights, member of the Faculty of Law here, and one of our most staunch supporters of the Cambridge Pro Bono Project, for which she sits on her, our faculty board. I'm going to say a couple of words of introduction about Eileen, and then I'm going to hand over to her to give a presentation for about 25 minutes. Uh, Stephanie has then kindly agreed to do a, a bit of a Q&A with Eileen, and there will also, of course, be an opportunity for you to ask any questions that you have that come up during the event. Our fantastic guest speaker, Eileen Dong, is a UN ambassador, distinguished member of the US Committee for Refugees and Immigrants Advisory Board, an expert in combating human trafficking. She served as the founder and executive director of Hope Phi, Phi X Global. I hope I said that correctly. If not, I'm sure she will correct me in a second. And she has also served as a consultant for the US Center for Countering Human Trafficking, Homeland Security Investigations, Department of Justice, and a number of other US government departments. Through this work, she has demonstrated again and again her commitment to eliminating abuse, exploitation, trafficking, violence, and torture while building safe spaces for survivors from all backgrounds. Her innovative approaches encourage cross-sector, intergenerational, and multidisciplinary collaborations to have a truly global approach to resolving this scourge on our society. She has played a pivotal role in advising on the UN's Declaration of Human Rights by the American Youth, aimed at eliminating abuse and exploitation. And she has also participated in a number of high-level summits, including the Department of Homeland Security's roundtable on the subject. Through her advocacy, she has also led to tripling the crimes victims' compensation through the passage of TX SB 49. And she has also... Uh, contributed to the allocation of at least one million US dollars to the first trauma recovery center in Texas. Today, I am delighted to welcome he her here, and we look forward to hearing from her on a number of topics, including the critical intersections between the UN's sustainable, uh, the UN's 2030 global goals, and the ongoing efforts to address gender-based violence and human trafficking. She will draw on her extensive experiences within this space to shed light on the vital role of cross-sector collaborations in addressing human rights violations and gender-based violence. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and our distinguished guests who are watching online. And um, I really appreciate all of you who are here today, despite the, the exam season, and I'm sure you all will do very well. And given the time, uh, I was explaining to everyone that these can be several lectures, so we're going to go through really fast, and Bowman will give me the time as needed.
So today's topic, we're going to talk about meeting at the crossroads, aligning the global goals to end exploitation. On Monday, April the 29th, I was actually in the UK. I turned on the TV and it's, the headline says, BBC News alerts us to alarming rise of sextortion in schools here in the UK. And some of you might have heard the sound of freedom in the US that hit uh, the, the ticket box for a large sum of people who has been watching. It is imperative that we confront the stark reality of modern day slavery with unwavering resolve and a renewed commitment to action. Today, I stand before you not just as an UN ambassador on global goals, but as a voice for the voiceless, for those who might no longer be here, who might still be here but don't have a voice yet, bearing witness to the harrowing tales of exploitation and abuse that plague our world. I was born and raised in China, and I was confronted with the harsh truth of human trafficking at an early age. When kids were told not to take candies from strangers, who would exploit them into forced begging? And today, women are being exploited into surrogacy, with the babies being sold to rich families, with proceeds going to the deep pockets of organized criminals organ traffickers, slaughter victims for rich clients' pockets, desperate for organs, cyber trafficking, fueled by technology, social media, and untraceable cryptocurrency, perpetuates the exploitation of innocent children into online sexual performances, while forced marriage often condemn young girls to lives of servitude physical violence, and sexual assault, let alone the female genital mutation. So today I wanted to start talking about, I'm sh sure that some of you might already be in the class of um, modern slavery, which I learned um, from our faculty here. We're going to touch upon a little bit on the human trafficking. And before that, I wanted to just make sure that everyone practices self-care because we are touching upon something that could potentially be traumatizing. And if you know or might have been a victim, re-victimization. So if you need to take a break and walk away, please make sure that you do so and practice self-care. And a little bit background, and uh, thank you, Jen, for asking me to uh, explain the name. Actually, it's called Hope Picks Global. And lots of people, uh, sometimes they call it PYX and uh, capitalize. Um, it's not actually an acronym, it's a word. Um, it has two meanings. In the English British Mint system is the box actually used to, to keep the, the silver. And uh, in the religious meaning, that's the box to keep the bread during the communion. Uh, so our organization really is survivor-led and driven by the purpose of survivor-centered, meaning that we have a mission to really su uh, service the survivors in various areas, including providing training for ESL, English as a second language if they are migrants or whoever English is not the first language. And for those who might have somewhat of an education but need to be stabilized because a lot of the victims, they don't really have a way to get out of the situation. We have worked with victims who were picked by the police or the law enforcement and later on dropped at the same corner where they were caught and arrested. And guess what they end up doing? They ended up re-trafficking themselves because that is the only way they know how to survive. And our vision is that in five years, we will build our first shelter. And as you know, some of you might know that there is a huge shelter shortage globally. 
The first shelter will be built in Houston, Texas, where I am based out of, but it is our goal that we will build shelters around the world. And with along with the holistic approach um, that we talked about the trauma recovery center, talk about the social enterprise to provide them the jobs that will sustain themselves as the long term. A little bit about myself, Jen had already kindly introduced myself, but uh, you know, amongst a few of the other orga uh, organizations and advisory board, I have also spoken on the TED Talk, which um, the links will be provided later on, and uh, a few of the major media like ABC and Fox News. I have spoken at the UNODC World Day Against Trafficking in Persons and the OSCE Conference of the Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons, for instance. And I have written a book, and I have been very honored that it hit uh, Amazon's number one new release, and uh, it's called Thank Your Predator Guide to Trauma Recovery from Abuse. This book covers several areas one is a step-by-step -step guide for victims and survivors to get out of the situation. I have had several meetings with people from around the world, including survivor-led organizations or survivor councils, and a lot of the times they were like, we need a hope for the survivors. Where do we go? And that is a book to give them the guide to, to show them where I have come from and how I have become a UN ambassador and the path to that. Additionally, as a expert in culturally sensitive care, I also provide training for law enforcement and criminal justice professionals. And in the book, it talks specifically about the culturally sensitive care and linguistically responsive approaches. And we've talked about SB 49 and the Trauma Recovery Center, and the link of the TED Talk will be on the future page. And these are just a few of the examples of the photos that we, uh, I have spoken at. So now let's dive into the meat of it. What is human trafficking? So according to the Department of Homeland Security, and there are different um, definitions by different organizations, but really when it comes to human trafficking or a lot of the times here called modern slavery, it is the force, fraud, and coercion. And it is for some sort of profit, whether it's sex or labor act. And the types of trafficking, and again, we're talking about internationally about human trafficking. In the US where I came from, forced marriage is not in the rule of law, unfortunately. And it is my job, that's why I'm here, to do the exchange. How can we learn from each other? How can we practice the best practices for people who had already known and do the job? And in, the, in Europe, surrogacy has been already included in the rule of law, but it's still an emerging topic in a lot of the regions. And that's something that's not even like mentioned on this slide when I was uh, you know, originally creating and still not included in most of the laws. But if you um, look at, are we okay with the, the sound? <laughs> We're okay? I just heard, okay. Um, so sex trafficking is mainly talked about. And I even mentioned about the sex torsion on the BBC because in the US, for instance, it's really driven by the ground. The ground funders have to abide by the very strict rules, say, okay, this fund is specifically for sex trafficking. So you can only serve sex trafficking victims and, uh, and sometimes even might include the age limit. Therefore, it's more known. Fortunately, I have seen a growth of organizations and the funding being redirected to labor trafficking now. And that is directed to both the agriculture, the textile, as well as the supply chain industry for the labor trafficking. Forced marriage, which I talked about, happened in a lot of the different regions, particularly here in the UK, related to the South Asian communities. And the domestic servitude, it comes, it, a lot of the times they intersect. It comes sometimes in the forced marriage, sometimes it's part of the labor trafficking. And we've mentioned about the organ trafficking, the, the forced bagging, and the, uh, the surrogacy 
as well as the forced criminality. And these are all the trafficking um, forms of trafficking that keeps coming. And a lot of them, for instance, the online sex trafficking, sexual exploitation has boomed ever since COVID. And we are constantly working, whether it's with OSC, with the UN, working on those emerging forms of trafficking and see how can we tackle that through the technology. Because remember, the traffickers, they are using the technology as well, the AI and everything. So we just um, had the Modern Slavery Spring Forum in London uh, by the Salvation Army UK and the University of Hull. And we had actually one of the sessions that talked about the AI as well. So it's a constantly evolving topic that we need to keep up to date about. Statistics. And I apologize for a little bit of the blurred vision. I couldn't seem to find the original one, but it really gives you a good statistics about what the the numbers uh, are um, in here in the in the UK. So, bear with me just one second. These stats are actually uh, extracted from December the eighth, twenty twenty three. And it has been estimated that there are at least 100,000 victims of modern slavery and human trafficking in the UK. Of the 16,938 potential victims referred to the NRM, which is the National Referral Mechanism, in 2022, 78%, that is about 13,000 victims, were male and 21%, that is about 3,600, were female. According to the National Crime Agency, the UK nationals are the most commonly identified victims of modern slavery and human trafficking occurring in the UK, followed by Albanians, Vietnamese, Romanian, and Indian nationals. And that's what I'm talking about. This is happening not just in my backyard in Houston, Texas. It's not just happening in Colombia, what's showing on the movie, the, the Sound of Freedom. It is actually happening in your backyard. It's happening everywhere, and we must pay close attention to. Organized crime groups engaged in coerced drug distributions often prioritize children during the recruitment targeting vulnerable such as social isolation, poor economic opportunities, and being in social care. It is highly likely that increased rates of absence and children missing in the education provide opportunities for drug distribution organized crime groups to recruit victims while also creating barriers to identify those already recruited. Almost two-thirds of British victims of modern slavery and human trafficking are children being exploited for criminality, and the number rounds to 2,534 victims, and many through counting lies, drug distribution in which organized crime groups transport and sell drugs in other areas, usually moving from cities to smaller towns and rural areas. Sexual exploitation typically occurs in brothels and escort agencies. Victims, particularly women and children, are subject to sexual and often physical abuse, which with many victims suffering long-term psychological distress as a result of their exploitation. I'll give you an example. I work with some of the survivor leaders in the U.S. and across the world. And I know people who are 60 years old, and male and female. And later on, you'll see the slides. It doesn't just happen to women and girls. It happened to men and boys as well. But some of the times, because of societal norms, people don't come out. And that's what I wrote in the book as well, because of the cultural norms. I come from China. I cannot talk about it. I come from uh, Lebanon, and our Arabic culture cannot talk about 
I come from the African American culture, and what happens in the family stays in the family. We don't talk about this, and people ended up having to just suck it up. And men say, you know what? Just suck it up, and just as if nothing happened. But later on, I met survivors who are strong. And they're 60 years old, as I mentioned. Some of them, their abusers, their perpetrators, has already died, and they are still suffering from that trauma. They were like, "I don't want to share my name to the public because I don't know what this person is going to do." But wait a minute, the the perpetrator has already died, and other situation of survivors. Maybe the perpetrator has died, but they have suffered not only the psychological distress. And there's a you know a whole talk I talk about what is the end result of the trauma. It causes so many、uh, physical and emotional distress. In the physical, including some of them had cardiovascular disease that they have to have open heart surgeries. And these are a lot of the、um, results from that. Very unfortunately, in the U.S., we have the National Human Trafficking Hotline, and based on the 2021 stats, we have received 32,000 and 700 phone calls, 11,000 text messages, 3,500 online tips, 2,800 emails, and 800 web chats. But I want to keep you、uh, keep in mind, and ask all of you to to think. You are all academias and researchers here, and this is just the stats. And imagine the people who does not have the knowledge of the the hotline number, who are under the control of their traffickers, do not have a way to call. And some of them simply do not speak the language, and so this is just a small percentage of the numbers that has called, and that gives you the idea of how big the crime and what the damage is doing to our human rights. Signs. These are just a few of the examples. Let's say if a person,、um, there there are different types of trafficking. Let's say the debt bondage. A trafficker comes to a foreigner, let's say from the Philippines, and give them this false promise: "Say I'm going to take you to the UK, the US, or wherever. You are going to be a nurse." And that person says, "But I don't have the money to go." Oh no, it's okay. We're going to do that. So that rings up what ten, twenty ground pounds or US dollars, and that's the debt bondage. And when they arrive. In the land, this is nowhere near what it actually is. They said, "Okay, this is what I asked you to do," and they are sent to brothels. And whether you want to do it or not, you have this debt. You have to pay me, and until you pay it off, and little you know, you never pay that off. And that goes to the physical abuse that we talked about earlier. We have had survivors who came out now and tell that they were held at gunpoint. And being told that you do it or you die, and you just you just do what the client asks you to do. And in the U.S., they use this slang, and and they don't really have a different name. I don't like to use that, but that's what they call the the bottom bitch. So they have the the trafficker. They have this middle person. So the trafficker will say. They, they, remember, this is like a criminal, like organized criminal ring. So you don't really see who the trafficker is, but they have that person who acts as the middle person, who is also a victim, but it's like the head of the victim. And the, this person will oversee, say, okay, this batch, you're going to see this client at this time. That you are going to see that client at that time, and then they collect the money and send it to the traffickers. But when the ring is busted, whether you know it's by the law enforcement or something, we never get to find who the traffickers are. And this is how bad it is. And physical restriction. If you see a sign like sometimes people. Uh, acting weird when when you go to a place and they were like no I'm not allowed to talk to you and they just look very scared or you go to the, they are going to the doctor maybe in the medical field they will have someone else accompanying them answering the question let's say、um, maybe they go to the gynecologist 
and they're not allowed to answer the question, and someone else is answering the question. And that is why it is so important to provide the training for the frontliners to recognize those signs so that we can inform the law enforcement agency about those potential victimization. And again, isolation, it's the same thing. If you see them like not being able to really have their own freedom of going to the public, I have had victims say, I have this person pick me up and drop me off. I'm not allowed to talk to any strangers. They have no keys to their residence. They have no cars, no vehicles, no driver's license. Their passports were withheld. And that goes to the, you know, the, the confiscating the victim's travel cards. A lot of those, they don't have their passport with them. And not to mention, they might have come on an illegal method based on, you know, the, that's the, the cross sector of the smuggled migrants and human trafficking. Because sometimes the smuggled, not all smuggled migrants are trafficking victims, but a lot of them, because of the vulnerability, they end up being the trafficking victim. And threatening, as I mentioned, um, with the, the violence, but also to the shaming that we talked about, the culture, the societal norms that prevents them from going. Deportation, same thing. If you go talk to the police, I'm going to report to the police that you are a legal alien here. And I have been traveling um, around Europe and the UK, and I understand you know, the, the modern slavery acts and a few of the laws here in the UK, as well as um, the election period, and as well as in Europe, and uh, uh, the, uh, talk to some of the NGOs in, in Vienna, in uh, France, for instance, and I understand that different countries are having like the border rules. But for me, looking at as a human rights activist, if you get kicked out of one country, you have to go to the other country. And they're just floating on the land until we find a permanent solution. These are displaced persons. And not to mention we have the, the Ukrainian war. The displaced persons, they can be internally displaced. They can be displaced in other countries just like this. Okay, I get deported. But my knowledge is based on my researches they get deported, but they were not identified as victims of trafficking. And that's what I like about serving on the advisory board of the USCRI. We have the TVAP and ASPIRE. Uh, these are the two programs. The TVAP actually is the Trafficking, Victim, uh, TVAP, Trafficking Victims Assistance Program, and ASPIRE is for the children. So the TVAP is for the adult victims of trafficking who are specifically non-U.S. citizens. And Aspire is the non-U.S. citizens who are the minors. And we need to develop a universal plan in different countries to have this model so that these victims, regardless of their nationality, it's a human rights violation. And who are the victims? As I mentioned earlier, Anyone can be a victim. I know victims who are, I hate to say that, two-year-old babies. I know victims who are 60, 70 years old, and they are being exploited. In Texas, where I came from, Houston, Texas, there was a mother who was arrested for exploiting her own baby daughter. And I want to ask you, um, two-year-old baby daughter, selling her 30 minutes for sexual performance, how much do you think she is selling the baby daughter for? Does anyone have some kind of guess? Give me a number. 500. That's pretty good. Higher. Maybe 1,000. That's close, 1,200, 1,200 US dollars. So if, yeah, so uh, the exchange rate, yes, it's, it's about that. That's how much she's selling for her own daughter. And that's why we need to keep our eyes open because not all the traffickers are what we used to think, or, or I used to think that traffickers are those with somehow had that imagination with tattoos and masculine and muscles and scary looking, what we call the gorilla pimps. 
We have the Romeo pimps who will groom the girls. And you know, in the interest of time, you can follow the social media. I, I post those all the time. But in the in, uh, it, it, there are Romeo pimps who groom the victims with love. I recently did a video for the Polaris Project. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Polaris Project is actually the nonprofit organization or the charity here called that runs the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So during the month of February, we did the love and trafficking, the misconception. What is love? What is trafficking? Because a lot of the times, it's not the victims are stupid. They just get trapped with this false reality that think the traffickers actually love them, and they never get to go. And again, that's a whole new topic. But really quickly about the power and control wheel, which is called the Duluth wheel, developed in the Minneapolis, Minnesota, had very much similarities. And that's why I say there's so much intersection when it comes to human trafficking, sexual assault, domestic violence, and even terrorism. And Criminals use all kinds of tactics in order to exploit them. So let's, going back to the power and control wheel, the person, at first, they will shower you with gifts and take you out for fine dining, say, I love you, I adore you, and I want to be your boyfriend. And not necessarily, it can be, you know, the woman can be the trafficker and try to groom the, girl, uh, the, the guy as well. And then next, they will portray that false reality, they actually do love you. And the next, remember what I said, isolation? They'll isolate you. They isolate you whether from your family, your friends. And they tell you that they don't love you. I love you. You just lo need me because I love you. And when that is done, they will manipulate you, the gaslighting. I actually learned that gaslighting actually come from the UK, from a, 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 a theater show. But gaslighting, they were gaslighting you, say, okay, no, 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 you said this, it's wrong because, because it's just, you're crazy <laughs> in a way. You're crazy, and, but I actually do love you. And imagine if you leave, no one else will love you. It's just me. So the victims say, well, I guess I will just stay. And this happens in both domestic violence and human trafficking. And that's a sign that we need to watch out for. Going to the stats about the percentages I mentioned earlier, there's 42% women, 23% men, 18% girls, and 17% boys. And that's the stats from the Department of Homeland Security. And as you can see that the boys and girls, they tie pretty close, and the men is about half of the percentage for, uh, from women. The revenue. Remember what I told you about, the, uh, you know, giving the example of whether it's labor trafficking, sex trafficking. Um, you know, I have a pair of uh, glasses here. If I sell the glass, whether it's 200 pounds, 500 pounds, 50 pounds, I sell it once, but that girl, they were selling for $1,200. They can sell them over and over and over again. And that's where this $150 billion come from. And to give you an idea, so I come from Houston again, and that's the, the oil and gas center of uh, the world's largest uh, headquarters uh, of uh, oil and gas companies, petroleum companies. That is the revenue of three major petroleum companies. That is how much money they're making of our people. And the different types of trafficking, as you can see, that the, the major uh, revenue comes from the sexual exploitation, and the next is labor exploitation, agriculture, and domestic work. Now, we've talked about the very sad news and the reality of the work that we have done. And I'm here to inform you about some of the core international human rights treaties. And um, I just want to make sure that our time is good. Five more minutes. Okay. So these are the nine core treaties that we have. The International Convention on Eliminating All Forms of Racial Discrimination on Civil and Political Rights, on the Economic and Social Cultural Rights, all forms of discrimination against women, torture and cruelty, and the rights of children, etc. 
but I wanted to talk about CEDAW really quickly. It's the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Di Discrimination Against Women. That's called the CEDAW. It was adopted in 1979 by the United Nations General Assembly. And this information I can be included in the video later uh, due to the interest of time. But regarding CEDAW, it is an international treaty defines that discrimination against women and sets up an agenda for national actions to end such a discrimination. The convention defines discriminations against women as distinction, exclusion, or restriction made on the basis of sex, which has the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise by women, irrespective of their marital status on the basis of equality of men and women. And I also want to touch upon the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights. On Article 4, that was de uh, adopted in 1948. Article 4 says, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. And we mentioned earlier about the Declaration of the Human Rights by the American youth, and one of the clause also mentioned about eliminating the torture, abuse, and exploitation. The UN and the Global Goals, there are at least three to five of the different SDGs that supports the elimination of human trafficking. And since I am specifically focusing on the SDG 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions, I wanted to discover, uh, discuss the target 16 Point two, which calls for the ending of abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against torture of children. So what's next? We've talked about the problems. We have trafficking, and it's in our backyard. It's in everyone's backyard. And as I mentioned, like so many of the topics, it's its own um, lecture that you can follow on the social media later, which I will have on the last slide. But I wanted to mention that you are the future human rights lawyers, or already are the international human rights lawyers, the legal and criminal justice professionals, and the community leaders and future community leaders. We hold a unique position and power and responsibility in the fight against exploitation. Today, I urge us to harness that power to drive meaningful change, both through our advocacy and our action. First and foremost, we must leverage our expertise to advocate for policy change. By working with legislators and policymakers, we can push for the implementation of laws and regulations that protect the rights of vulnerable individuals and prevent exploitation whether it's advocating for stronger anti-trafficking measures, promoting gender equality, or combating child labor, all voices can, be make, can make a difference in shaping the legal landscape and creating a safer and more just society. And furthermore, we must prioritize research and data analysis to inform data-driven and evidence-based policymaking, as I have mentioned earlier. I mean, in the interest of time, uh, I suggest that that's a good point to move across to the Q&A. Absolutely. Would you like another 30 seconds to wrap up, or are you yes. to move um, to the I'll just uh, wrap up the, the final paragraph. Uh, yes. So finally, I just wanted to mention about the multidisciplinary collaboration through the multidisciplinary collaboration, we can amplify our impact and create a more inclusive and effective response to exploitation and human rights violations. We must remain committed to end exploitation in all of its forms, both locally and globally, whether it's through pro bono work, volunteerism, or public 
advocacy campaigns, we can all play a role in raising awareness, mobilizing support, and driving changes. And together, we can build a world where every individual is treated with dignity, respect, and equality, a world free from exploitation and injustice. Thank you for your dedication, and thank you for Cambridge and all your staff for having me here.